I want to welcome Leslie O'Flavahan. Is that right? Did I pronounce it right? No. It's O'Flahaven. O'Flahaven. Sorry. O'Flahaven. Okay. Uh, well, I'll leave it in. That will let okay. the students know that I also make mistakes. There okay. we go. Um, we are delighted to have you with us. Um, we have uh, spent some time in your LinkedIn course on writing in plain language, um, which I think the students are going to be really excited um, to get to meet you outside of that more formal venue. But one of the questions that they have is um, a little bit about your professional experience. In other words, not only how did you get started in plain language, but how did you end up with a course on LinkedIn in plain language? Indeed, I'd be glad to answer that. So um, whenever, whenever I'm asked about my work history, the first thing I do is cut my eyes over to my computer clock because um, I have a lot of work history <laughs> and I'm afraid I'm going to talk too long. So this answer, I'm gonna come in under two minutes. Here I go. So I, I was trained as an English teacher, a high school English teacher, and uh, it was a career I loved. I was a high school English teacher for nine years and I taught writing mostly. That's my passion and that's my uh, professional expertise. And when my first uh, daughter was born, who's just turned 30, I, I had a very naive thought, which was, I cannot possibly work full time as a teacher and uh, raise this child. That is impossible. What I'll do is start my own business. Well, the universe has a great sense of humor because I didn't have more free time as a self-employed person. And in some ways, I had less free time. So when I became a self-employed consultant for about three, four, five years, I was kind of an itinerant freelance education writer. And because I live in the Washington DC area, I wrote curriculum for various Smithsonian institutions. And then I did a class or two, a day long class or two of writing training at a federal agency. And this was just at the time that business email was coming into the workplace. I told you I've been in it for a while. And when people started answering and writing business emails at their desks, I, as an experienced writing teacher, knew that, that was going to change their writing life a lot. Because uh, in a lot of ways, email is improv. And the the point at which you create it and you publish it, it's almost simultaneous. You create and you publish. Most other kinds of business writing you create and you review and you publish, they're not improv. So as a writing teacher, I knew, ah, something big is going to happen. And another woman and I formed eWrite in 1995 and we officially launched in 1996 because we had a strong sense that there would be a market for help in writing better email. And we were wrong, <laughs> we were wrong. No one cared about writing better email when it was first launched. What they wanted to know about and what we could help with was helping people write better web content. And that's how eWrite was formed. And I'll quick fast forward because I'm watching that clock. Um, my LinkedIn learning courses, the six I have done, the plain language course is the sixth. These have been a, a professional gift, but not an accident, a gift to me. And that is the first course I was recruited to do, and that was the one on writing customer service email. And it, I did it in 2016, and it was published in 2017. And the others that fell along, uh, some they asked me to do, and some I pushed to do. And the plain language one, I pushed. I advocated for it because I believed in it. Awesome. How important is email today versus maybe in the past? And is chat taking over as the way to deliver customer service? Uh, yes, I think chat is. And chat and messaging are taking over uh, many people's preferences for how they want to communicate with companies, though uh, many companies lag behind customers' preferences. Um, I, still, in this day and age, most customer service interactions are by telephone call, most, a large percentage. Email and, and live chat are vying for the percentage they represent of the number of contacts. And then text messages 
are starting to creep up into that number of chats and emails. Um, I think that email as a customer service channel is, is on its way out. It, it's dying a slowish death and the death rate may accelerate. And that's because the younger a person is, the younger an adult consumer is, the less likely they are to have a lively writing life in their inbox. The inbox is a, is a workplace channel and really not a very welcome one. And with Slack and all other kinds of messaging channels, people even at, at work, people aren't spending much time in their inbox. So I think email will dwindle in, in the number of contacts it carries for companies who, who give customer service in that channel. We're talking, you're talking mostly about customer B2C organizations. What kind of, do you know much about, have you worked much with B2B? Yes, of course. Yes, I have. Would you yeah. talk a little bit about how customer service works there and the role of writing with customers? Indeed, the, there's little difference, though they, B2, B2B organizations sometimes think there's a lot of difference, but there's little difference. It's the same, not very big difference difference from public facing web content and the intranet. Not a big difference, you know. So um, there's sometimes the uh, communication in a B2B situation, customer service communication can endure a little bit more jargon. It can endure uh, some more insider references to processes or mission or, you know, organizations, for example, that have a a uh, partner or an affiliate structure, uh, everyone who's requesting service or reading the responses for service, they understand those structures. They don't need much help in understanding them, but everyone needs plain language. And, and actually, I think we are beholden to give our readers plain language, but we're really beholden to give the readers who are just like us plain language because you know you don't you don't feed your family a horrible dinner just because they will eat it you know you feed your family a delicious meal because they will enjoy it and we don't we don't inflict unplain language on b2b connections simply because they're a little bit they share more vocabulary with us that's just wrong who have you found most resistant to writing in plain language. So you've, you've worked with lots of people, lots of industries, lots of different types of writers. Um, who do you think is most resistant? Um, I'll, I'll answer this in two ways. The most resistant profession is in, inside companies is the, the lawyers because for them, the, every word can, carries a measurable amount of risk and the risks are not to be denied because they'll be hashed out in court. So what I have found, sometimes I work with marketing teams, some, sometimes I work with content teams, sometimes I work with scientists or customer service teams. However closely that team works with lawyers, I can predict their caution level will go way up. That's how that's that's where the resistance comes from. So um, so if, for example, I'm working with um, a, a group of scientists, for example, I recently worked at the Mind Safety and Health Administration, which is a government agency, the um, the, the lawyers leave them alone. That's a research group. So, so they were, while their, their writing was thick to the point of impenetrability, we could still convince them there was nothing to be afraid of. It was just a strange task to write in plain language. But when I work in customer care, for example, with a consumer packaged goods company that sells pharmaceuticals or skincare products, their lawyers are very close to that operation and they are trying to protect themselves from legal risk. So when a customer emails in and says, um, I used your headache tablets and then I got a rash. From a customer service standpoint, a plain language response would be, thank you for letting us know that immediately after you used our headache tablets, you got a rash. That's an empathetic plain customer service response, but the lawyers aren't having any of that because now we just admitted that the tablets gave the rash. 
So it, the caution, the resistance to plain language comes from people's perceived risk or a profession's perceived risk at a, 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 a estimation of how much legal risk they're at. Excellent, very, very interesting. Kim, in the example I just gave, we can satisfy the customer's need to read a plain language response and the company's aversion to legal risk. These are not exclusive, we can okay. do both. So we could write back, thank you very much for letting us know about what happened when you took our headache tablets. I didn't mention the rash. We, okay. And then the second, or the, what, what did I say, hives or something? Yeah. And the second sentence would be something like, we, we want to be sure that you get the headache relief that our tablets okay. are intended to provide. Okay. And then, you know, there's plenty to say. There's plenty of plain language to say that doesn't increase the legal risk. Okay. That's super important to know because I'm, I'm guessing most people like me just assume that if you're going to protect yourself, you can't use plain language. Absolutely not. So in considering uh, like the, the dumbing down of language, like, um, like the, the assignment we just had that was based on a HUD response, like how, do you, how much do you consider audience, Leslie? Because like uh, I've been a renter for a long time and I've known other people who have rented and I really took out a lot of the larger words because I knew some people, I knew a lot of people would immediately shut down and other people, English is their second language. So I was trying not to dumb it down, but how much do you really consider your audience? Because you don't want to be um, uh, insulting, but you also really want to be clear. Indeed. Um, first of all, people who resist plain language as a communication philosophy or as an editorial practice. They use the phrase dumbing down, but we, we never do. We never do. We're not having it, right? We don't say it. That's the D word. We don't say it. So what we say instead is, no, I'm not dumbing it down. I'm writing for my intended reader. I understand what my intended reader needs and I'm writing for my intended reader. And anything that fails to make this content useful for my intended reader is the problem, not the fact that I'm simplifying some of the draft or the original content. So the, the challenge is sometimes we actually know our intended reader's level of sophistication or, or language capabilities, and sometimes we're guessing. And what we actually only know is that this version that HUD published is too complicated, right? So when we actually know our readers, when there's a relatively narrow set of readers, not a super broad one, like Laura, your example was um, renters, prospective renters, first language English renters, uh, land, other landlords, second language English renters. This is a wide readership and we don't know everything we might need to know about all of them. So as plain language editors or advocates, we're, we're reducing the complexity of the content on, on the reader's behalf because we believe we probably understand what the readers need. But, you know, I would, would, I'm glad you said dumbing down because I want you all, if you intend to do plain language work or if the philosophies of plain language mean something to you, I want you to pick that dumbing down up and you beat resistors over the head with it, okay? Because that is, an, uh, that is kind of um, an aristocratic approach, don't you think? You know, like, oh, these, <laughs> these renters, they need my help, you know? Yeah, they need your help. So we're not dumbing it down, we're making it useful for them. How much do you think the 2010 Plain Language Act, how much impact do you believe it's had on the way our federal government communicates with us? A great deal and not enough, yeah. In fact, I was, uh, I, I started a plain language weekly clubhouse. If anyone's on clubhouse, I started it and we met for the first time today. There were just three of us gassing on and the, um, the, the, we talked a lot about 
the lack of consequences for not writing in plain language. So the Plain Writing Act of 2010 is 10 years old. It took about 45 years or 40 years of advocacy in the federal government to get it passed. And now it's 10 years old. And it would be easy to sit back and say, yeah, that didn't do anything because the requirements of the Plain Writing Act of 2010 are, are ones without punishment for, you can ignore, agencies can ignore them without punishment. And yet, Kim, I am certain we wouldn't be having this class or this conversation if it weren't for the Plain Writing Act of 2010. And I am also certain that the possible plain language professionals who are joining us on the Zoom meeting, the, the plain language professionals of the future wouldn't, wouldn't be here with the same readiness. So I often compare the Plain Writing Act of 2010 to the food pyramid, which has been replaced by the USDA with the plate or something, but we know what the food pyramid is. It's not that the food pyramid forced people to eat healthy foods. It didn't, but it described a healthy diet. And without an accurate and nimble description of a healthy diet, we couldn't easily measure what we or children or people who were feeding in any setting was healthy, whether their diet was healthy. And that's why the Plain Writing Act of 2010 has been so important because it fostered a community of professionals like us it has multiple awards in agencies outside of federal agencies, so recognition for plain writing, and it has uh, driven research and funding. So it, to me, it's a great success. It hasn't punished many people, but it's embarrassed quite a few. One of the things that I, uh, of course, told students about is the, the um, Plain Language Center and, or the Center for Plain Language and their annual report card um, which I think is, that is all done so well. Um, if that doesn't convince people that you want to be in the column where you're making at least <laughs> passing grades. Um, and, and many of the agencies that they're looking at are making passing grades. Yes. You know, there are, HUD happens to be one that's not, which is why I selected their stuff um, for the students exercise uh, mm -hmm. this week. So um, I actually deal with HUD a lot just because I work in the mortgage industry. So I've read through a lot of HUD th related things and I write a lot of it. And one thing that really does bother me is the fact that we can't enforce some sort of plain language um, for customers really. And I guess my question is more, how can we don't look at plain language as through the lens of accessibility and Maybe we do, but I, I kind of take that along the lines of, um, you know, creating accommodations for those who are deaf and they need to call in or they have an issue or those who are hard of seeing and they get braille documents. So I feel like plain language really should be an accessibility item. And it's interesting that it's outside of that. Indeed, you know, the uh, section 508 predates the Plain Writing Act of 2010, but you're right, they go hand in hand. I mean. Um, I, I, I often think about the Plain Writing Act of 2010, and I have worked with many government agencies who care about it or those who don't care about it, or those who don't even know about it. But um, the idea that uh, the, the distillation of the Plain Writing Act is that your intended reader is, uh, is entitled to understand, care about, and act on what you've written. And that also does cross over to when we think about making content accessible, this intended or possible reader is, in under, is entitled to be able to access what I've written. So I think that's really well said, Danielle. And you know, I, I, I'm sure you're all a bit discouraged or maybe even disgusted by this difficult HUD content that you looked at, but there are so many examples of clear, efficient communication. So Danielle, you mentioned you work in the mortgage industry and if you have used uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's content, the CFPB, you're, th these are the most elegant 
um, plain language writers in the federal government, except for all of the other ones, the National Cancer Institute. I mean, they, they respond with such clarity and such poise. And then it's just one after another organization, components within an agency that are communicating very, very clearly. And sometimes we want, like the Energy Information Administration, I highly recommend that you look at EIA.gov, Energy Information Administration. They are one of the, I think, eight statistical agencies in the federal government. The Bureau of Labor Statistics is another. And EIA communicates about fuel and energy costs boring, but no. I mean, they are well renowned, multiple clear mark award winners. Um, and they and their their communications will show you again and again that there are gifted government communicators who are really making content easy for people to read. Do you believe me? <laughs> The, the oh, CFPB, Danielle, is definitely, they're one of the organizations that, one of the federal um, offices, that uh, they always earn high praise from uh, those annual report cards. In fact, I think they have, they almost always have an A. Yeah. Um, so they, they work really hard um, to do a great job including things like, you know, user testing, and really all the best practices that we teach you all about. Um, they, they have, uh, they've adopted all of those. They really have. How many of these clients that you work with, do they all have style guides? Do they have voice and tone guides? Do they, do they, are they any good? Do they use them? Uh, do you use them when you do training or writing for them? Mm -hmm. This is very easy for me to answer because one of the services I offer is to write st style guides or to write brand voice and tone style guides or to update the style guides. Um, many of the organizations I work with, most of them have some kind of voice and tone and brand style guide. Most of the time, the writing advice is not deep and not ample. So, and, and you know, this is very dear to me because because I think people's I, I'm fond, I'm fond, and and people's mistakes most of the time I think they're kind of sweet, especially when I'm in the role where I can help, so that I don't bother getting all angry. The the advice is all the same. They, they all say. We communicate in a natural style, we're empathetic, we're conversational, they all say this, and the writing almost never is. So that suggests that people aren't reading the style guide, but I think it's actually two different problems other than they're not reading it. Number one, many, many people don't know the company has a style guide. They don't know. The communicators do, and especially any communicator who's spending money on a PR agency or an ad agency, they know about the style guide because lots of times the brand voice style guide also includes guidance about the, you know, the pixels of the logo and the color palette and, and the font and all that. The other thing is, the other reason the style guide's underused is because it doesn't include actionable advice. And that's often where I come in. If the style guide is 35 pages long, and if it talks about our mission, our core values, and our logo, and our color palette, and the imagery we use in our font, it's going to have two pages about voice and tone. And the pages will say, we write in an empathetic conversational tone. They all say this. But non-writers can't follow that advice. It's too abstract. And so what I usually do is build these style guides out, build them out big. So there's examples because the less writerly a person is, the less nimble they are with words, the more they'll rely on the example. And that's, that's the kind of work I've done. And, and I wish I could share it with you right now, but um, end of December, I wrote a web content style guide for the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And this will be available publicly. And, and I wrote it according to my own values of writing a style guide, namely fully 
illustrated with positive examples from the organization's own content and annotations for those examples. I can't wait to see it. That's awesome. I will use it in the future. Um, use it. It's copyright cleared. Use. Awesome. Awesome. Paid for by our tax dollars. Indeed. There you go. Indeed. What do you think about readability formulas? Do they help you? <laughs> do, they, do, they, do they help anyone achieve plain language, do you think? They help. Um, they help very good writers achieve plain language, and they also help um, people who know very concretely what their readers can, what, what their readers reading level is, they may help them a great deal. I don't find much value and I do find much damage in the reading readability scores that describe a person's grade level. This is just stupid because grade level, you know, what, what did I go, did I go to, I don't know, did I go to 20th grade? I don't know, what grade level did I go through? I, you know, and I did it 40 years ago. What in the world does this describe about me? I would never describe myself as an eighth grade reader. And yet I subscribe to the Washington Post, which is ostensibly written at the seventh grade level, I think. And often I read an article twice because I didn't understand it the first time. So I, I hope our profession will, and actually I hope our profession will kind of obscure this term grade level, because I think it allows people to dismiss these measures because describing the grade level of the reader is random to them. So uh, readability uh, statistics, I think can be quite useful if you want a quick picture of your content. I'll give you an example. One of my clients is the Washington Metropolitan Transit Authority. It's our subway system. And their internal communicators had been saying that uh, their internal newsletters were too boring and they wanted to write them better. I said, okay, let's talk about this. And the boss's 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 boss is a big fan of Axios, the news publisher. And so what, what they had been saying internally was, we want our internal newsletters to be written in Axios style. Now, this is a bad idea and a good idea at once. It's good to have a model to know what you're going toward. It's a bad idea to talk about internal communications newsletters sounding like breaking news Axios. That's, that's not a good connection, but that was what they had. So as part of the workshop I developed, I did a lot of readability statistics on the Axios style. So when we sat down and said, we want, we have a model, we were able to see, ooh, look under the hood. How is it built? What percentage passive voice are they using? How long are their paragraphs? How long are their sentences? That was a, a quite a useful application of readability statistics. Awesome. So the, the reason that I asked that question, I mean, I think that Leslie probably knows I'm not much of a fan of readability formulas, um, but they, I do believe they have a place. And I love that you have an example of how you can use readability formulas within the context of a bigger effort um, to help convince people or give people a snapshot of what content looks like. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, the, the students, one of the things that they're doing this week in my class, not all of these folks are in that class, but the ones that are, um, they are, I asked them to compute readability uh, in at least one way on the uh, con HUD content that they're reviewing. So I didn't ask them to do it to their own because I don't, whatever, it's not really, I don't believe it has any real value for them mm -hmm. in helping them revise necessarily. Um, but I did think that it would be really useful for them as an exercise to see. So what does the readability formula tell me about the quality of this content now? Is it better? Is it, what is it missing? Mm -hmm. um, uh, because I think anybody who, who creates content or messes with content for a living needs to know something about readability because non-experts know what readability, well, they've heard of it. Yes, they do, they do. And actually, I agree with you completely. This is a job skill. So yeah. you wanna know how the different uh, readability scores 
what, what uh, subtle differences they'll reveal and you want to have one you prefer, the less worser, the yes. less worst one. <laughs> and, and you want to be able to talk about when they're um, um, authentic measures of quality and when they aren't. So, you know, I mentioned earlier in my brief introduction for a while, a long time ago, I was writing educational materials for the Smithsonian Institution. And, and those were written strictly to certain grade or reading levels because we knew exactly who was going to use them. And there was no stepping off of the uh, readability level for the curriculum. So sometimes they are useful. It's, to me, I always think that a readability score is like a yardstick. And if you walk around with a 10 foot yardstick trying to figure out whether people are tall or short, everyone's short. You know? <laughs> so you need the right size yardstick or you're not gonna learn anything. <laughs> That's terrific. Yes, I actually want to add on to that because uh, I've had a content analysis class last semester where we really focused on re readability scores. And that was like one of the more frustrating things because we had to prove everything that we, all of our points by comparing the different um, scores. And I was just like finding that ones that were just based off of like exact like reading level, like the scores from like whatever grade you're in, I was kind of wondering why is say ninth grade, why is that like the plain language standard that we have to constantly follow? Um, so I was just like wondering, do you think that we should just like stop using those like all together? I know you said it's good to have like a good, they're good for like a good like snapshot of kind of like where your writing is at that point in time, but do you think they're doing more harm than good? I do in some cases, but let's let's imagine you're going forward as a professional communicator and someone has asked you to use those measures in your work. And you know, your thought bubble says like, oh, terrible idea, I don't wanna do that. But they, they're, they've asked you to, they require you to, or they may, um, they may have a measure in place. They may say, we write to the seventh grade level. Well, as a professional communicator, you'd want to ask them, well, why? Why? Do you know why? But they, they may not end up with a good answer and they're paying you and it'll be your job to, to suck it up. You know, I mean, that's just the way it goes. So that's why I would say, know them well enough, know them the various measures well enough. And you know, there's at least four or five that professional communicators accept where you could push to substitute one for reading level for grade level if you thought another one was better or you could push to say I want I just want to use a software application like Grammarly Visible Thread Hemingway I'm just going to I'm just going to use some software here that that's a better outcome and then you know people who don't understand why readability scores are not the be all and end all this is wicked what I'm going to say, but they can often be dissuaded by one study. So what you would do is queue up some research that supports your standpoint, some usability research that supports your standpoint, and then push back a little against that um, not very useful readability measure. And then you might end up doing what they've asked you to do because life. <laughs> Thank you. That really helped. Leslie, will you give us a story maybe to end? Sure. Tell us about, you can take a few minutes to think about um, an answer. One of your biggest wins, you know, like a, a time when you thought, well, I'm not sure how this is going to go, but it ended up being way better than you thought it would be, or you overcame I don't know, it, tremendous resistance to change and somehow it happened, it happened anyway. I would be glad to tell a story and thank you for asking that is the, that's a sweet request. But before I tell it, because then we'll wrap up, I just wanted to say thank you, Kim, and what a joy to be with you. And anyone who's on this call or any of your students, if you want to contact me, I, you know, I'd be more than happy to hear from you. Um, I'll put, I, you know, here's my email. There's my email, so you can sure reach out to me that way. Um, I, I've I formed this company, Eright, in 1996, so it's been a while, and I have had um, bone dry, frustrating projects, and I have had pinch me projects, and I'll tell you about one of them where where it was 
deep and wide. We could go deep and wide. And so the outcomes were great. So here's my quick story, catching the computer uh, clock so I don't go on too long again. In 2013, 14, and 17, I worked with Delta Airlines customer care team. This was about, mm, about 400 people in Georgia, about, uh, I don't know, maybe 40 or 50 in Minneapolis, and about 400 people in um, Mumbai and in Pune in India, two cities in India. Their marketing uh, team in 2013 had done a huge rebrand, including even changing the flight attendants' uniforms. And what they wanted to do is take all that the, I, I always call these like the, the hipster glasses and substash people, the, the people with some, with some, <laughs> you know, swagger, all of those folks, they wanted to make sure that the frontline customer service agents, the hundreds I mentioned, could write to customers in an updated and modern brand voice because they were writing to customers in a very outdated brand voice. So briefly, I'll describe the project, and then I want to tell you the project's name because it was so wonderful. The services I offered included developing a, a writing curriculum for all those hundreds of frontline customer service agents in the four locations. I wrote a customer care brand voice style guide that supported the corporate style guide, but was specific for people who write to customers all day. Um, I developed a, a briefing that I delivered for executives several times, and I got to go to India three times to work with their writers there. So, and, and the, the writing really, really did change. With that much input and those resources, people's writing did change. To kick off the project, Delta asked all of its employees who would be participating in it whether they wanted to give the project a name. They said, our project is to write in a modern, on-brand, plain language style to our customers. Can anyone propose a name? It was a contest and there was an award. And the winning name was Project LOL. <laughs> and it stood for Project Less Official language. And it, that sets the tone. We had t-shirts, we had lanyards, we had prizes, and we, it, the work I did mattered. And it changed Delta's communication style via email substantially and measurably because there was also a measurement com component to this project. Now, in the intervening years, Delta has moved more of its customer contacts away from email. In general, customer satisfaction scores are lower in email than they are in other channels, but the, the leave behind work still stands. A terrific, that's a terrific story. I love it. Project LOL. Less official language. And, and they invited all of those hundreds of people to share pictures. How do you LOL? <laughs> and so, so people had pictures of themselves with their two German shepherds in their lap and the German shepherds have their fingers on the keyboard and somebody took their laptop and stuck it on a treadmill and did a video of themselves trying to answer emails while they were on a treadmill. It was really, it was playful and corporate. I am so thrilled that we got to have you live with us um, for a little while today. And I, I am so grateful that you were willing to take time out of your your day to spend it with us. It's my pleasure. And I, if, you know, besides getting to spend some time with you, Kim, personally, I, I really do want to encourage you, if any of you, if you're thinking of making a career here, I hope it was my plan to convey joy. I feel it and I, I wanted to share it. So it's been a wonderful career and, and um, I, I'll encourage you all along the way.